Et nos amours, faut-il qu'ils m'en souviennent Welcome to The Thing About France, a podcast where American cultural figures explore the fascinating and complicated relationship between France and America. I'm Benedict de Montlor, and this is The Thing About France. Adam Weinberg is the director of the Whitney Museum of American Art, one of the most important museums in America. I met him at Albertine, our fabulous bookstore on Fifth Avenue, where we held a ceremony to award him with the Legion of Honor. On that occasion, I discovered not only a world-class museum director, but also a generous, down-to-earth person. He made me feel comfortable talking about his life in Paris, where in fact his daughter was born. For this podcast, we talked about cultural appropriation, funding for the arts, and cultural life in France and America. Allez, c'est parti Hello, Adam Weinberg, and welcome to The Thing About France. Thank you. It's great to be here. Thank you for inviting me. You're the director of the Whitney Museum of American Art. But what many people may not know is that you're also a huge Francophile. In fact, you even work in Paris as the director of the American Center. So tell me, when did you first encounter France and what were your first associations with French art and culture? Well, I think my first encounter actually was as a teenager when I went to France, and that would have been in the in the late 60s. And actually, I think Paris was my first city in Europe that I really have a recollection of. And it was a very different experience of museums in those days. I remember how relaxed it was. Uh, the idea of environmental control in a museum meant an open window so that you could open the window. And I just remember the light, the air, and kind of the, um, you know, the sense of, culture being part of the everyday life of people. The separation between daily life and culture was a little bit more integrated, and I think that was something that struck me right away. What is your favorite museum in France? I have a special feeling for Pompidou. I mean, the Whitney Museum was designed by Renzo Piano, and, um, and when we designed the building, what we said to Renzo is we would like you to combine the characteristics of what we think of as your two great museums. The Pompidou Center, which you designed with Richard Rogers, and the Menil Museum, um, which was the Du Menil Museum. And, and what the Pompidou Center is, is about the energy of the city. It's about connecting to the people. It's about connecting to the streets. About It's a community center as much as it is a museum. I mean, it's and that's why it's called Pompidou Center. It's not Musée Pompidou. It is really about intellectual life as well as, you know, being a museum. And the design of the museum reflects that and that both the space around it and the way you travel through the museum and look out into the city. But one of the things we also loved about the Manil Museum in Texas, in Houston, Texas, is that sense of quiet and the sense of reflection. And that's what we tried to do at our new building is to get the best characteristics of both. And um, then after a while in Paris, you came back to New York as the director of the Whitney Museum. And this leads me to another important question. Uh, what is American art today? You know, the, the history of 20th century and 19th century American art, particularly in the 20th century, was the idea, it's what I call the artichoke theory. The belief that if you could peel away all the leaves of the artichoke, and then you would get to the essence of what was an American artist. And that was, you know, everybody asked the question for many years from the 1940s, 50s, 60s, what is American about American art? And they believe that if you peel away the leaves of the artichoke, eventually you'll get to the pure idea of what American art is. That was ridiculous because there is no notion of pure artistic purity. It was all of the leaves of the artichoke that actually make the artichoke as much as the heart of it. And that's what we see today in American culture. It's made up of Latino culture, Native American culture, African American. But it, it has always been the case. But to a large extent, we have not fully acknowledged and we've ignored that. And that is what we try to do today is understand that American art is 
made up of American artists who are culture of cultures, but it's also about the influences that come in from other cultures. that are sometimes short term and sometimes longer term. So in France, funding comes largely from public sources, while in America, it comes from private donors. And it's interesting to hear that in France, director of museum uses public funding as a source of their independence from corporate interest. Well, in America, I've heard museum directors saying that their model is a source of independence from political influence. So what is your point of view? How do you feel on private versus public funding? Well, my feeling has always been um, that it would be best for our cultural institutions to have money coming from a range of sources. You don't want to be reliant on funds from any one um, area. You don't, uh, you know, a certain amount should come from your earned income, um, a certain amount from an endowment, which is money that you raise funds for and then you invest it and you get a percentage of that money. Some should be from private individuals and some should be from the public sector. We're in um, at the Whitney, in the, and which is not atypical, we receive less than 1%, less than 1% of our funding for annual operating from any government sources, either federal, state, or local. Now, there are museums in New York and there are the Smithsonian institutions, which are part of the federal uh, government that get uh, larger percentages. But the great majority of institutions in the United States get very little government money. And I think I would not want to be completely beholden to the government but I, I would prefer not to be completely beholden to donors either. I think that what you want is a balance so that you, as much freedom as possibility, and it's not just freedom in terms of, of what it is that you're doing, but it's also um, financial freedom because if you have a certain amount coming from government sources and the government source money disappears, then you can still try to make it up with private source. If you, if the, you know, if the private sources start to disappear, you can at least have some government funding. You want a balance of those kinds of things. And I think that, you know, in our situation, it's, it's a, it's a bit more extreme because we have so little government support. Now there are benefits to that too. We have no um, official censorship. And one of the things that is very clear is while we have private donors, um, in my 15 years as the director of the museum, I have never had the interference of my board of trustees on uh, showing an artist's work, on buying an artist's work, on the programs that we have presented. Uh, they understand that it's sort of like church and state, that you don't, that the trustees do not get involved with the programming activities of the museum. That gives us tremendous amount of artistic, intellectual, and social and political freedom within that. I think that where things start to get a little bit more complicated these days is, and you know, and hence is the younger generation, you know, has great beliefs and great hopes for our cultural institutions because, particularly the contemporary ones that uh, present the voices of artists um, in social and political contexts that are very um, progressive. But what is very hard is we cannot confuse the voices of artists that we support versus our own voices in that we are not the artists within the institution. And I think that's a hard thing for younger people. I understand they want more, they demand more, they expect more. And I respect that. On the other hand, it's also very hard because each of us has our role as individuals. I am Adam Weinberg, but I'm also the director of the Whitney Museum. They are two different functions. You know, I have my own personal beliefs, what I think, and then I have my job as the director of the museum that needs to guide the mission of the institution according to its philosophy, its history, its principles. And, you know, the principles have been to let the artists have their voices, to speak up in whatever way they want to. But we cannot confuse that. That is not about us the staff members, the director. It's not about me saying I am in favor of this or I am saying uh, I believe in this particular cause. That's irrelevant in a way. If the artist choose to be in favor of certain things, whatever it is, it's, I mean, this is not just about politics. It could be about, you know, what art should be, you know, should it be multimedia? Should it be outside the museum? Should it, you know, deconstruct the museum, both intellectually or physically in any way? That is 
our job is to support the voices of those artists and to support those artists because we believe that they have something, insights that are really changing our perception of the world and of ourselves. And that is our job. Our job is not to present our own personal political opinions in the guise of the institution. And that, it's very hard. It's subtle. It's complex. It's layered. And I think that's very hard for a lot of people. They want to see it as black and white. Well, how can you support this trustee um, if this trustee does X and Y? It's not about the trustee. It's about what we present as an institution. There are so many contradictions in the capitalist system. And if we exist within that system, we have to accept those contradictions. That doesn't mean that outside the institution, people can't push back and change that. But I think within the institution, it's very hard to do. But it's true that what would strike me as a French person is that you have the name of your donors everywhere mm -hmm. in your shows, in the walls of your museum. Everywhere. And sometimes those donors made their fortune and have values that differ exactly. from the values of your museum. And still you have their names everywhere. So how, how do you, you deal with that? that? I don't know. I think I should ask you that because, you know, I look at... Um, the Nobel Prize was created by um, Nobel because he created dynamite. You know, every artist in the United States and every critic who gets a Guggenheim Award is very proud of that. But, you know, Mr. Guggenheim made his money in the mines of Colorado and, you know, on the lives of workers who were struggling. I don't know the specifics, but I'm sure the Whitney family, they made their money on the railroads. Who built those railroads? What did the railroads do? I mean... I think it becomes very, very hard because if you start looking at where all this money comes from, and not that one shouldn't, I, I have no problem with that, but one has to accept that people are producing things in ways and producing things that may not be good for our environment, may not be good for our health, may not be good for social attitudes, and not that, you know, that that's something um, good. But it's a very, very slippery slope because before you look too hard, you realize that almost all the money that gets there has compromises potentially that are made to it. So what do you do? So for you, what's important? Is government is that... money all legitimate money? No, no, not any more than private money is in that sense. So for you, what's important is that those donors don't interfere in the programming. Correct. But for and, instance... And that the money that is used is put out there for the purposes of reaching higher artistic, social, cultural good. I mean, I believe that that is one of the dynamics, one of the dialectics of capitalist culture is that, you know, this money sometimes, which is not always from the best of purposes, ends up being able to be used for really good purposes. And Some people think that the end, you know, that the ends don't justify the means. And I'm not sure that they necessarily do, but it is the way we exist. So let's take this money. And this is, many of the artists that I've talked to in the last month or two, they say, look, there's no such thing as purity here in terms of uh, the idea of, you know, money being made from pure sources. So let's take this money and turn it to good and use it in a very, very positive way. Tell me about your life in Paris when you were at the American mm. Center. Was it very different to work in an American institution, but in France, from working here in the U.S.? It was very, I have to say, it was very difficult for me in many ways. I mean, it was a fascinating process of working because the institution, the American Center, which no longer exists, was truly a bicultural institution. That was very exciting. But, you know, the way American systems work and the way French systems work are very different. And um, in the United States, at least, decisions are made all the way up various levels in the United States. And at the time in France, I haven't worked in France now in 20 years, but I mean, in any real way, decisions were mostly made at the top. And um, that was very frustrating for an American because not that we make all the decisions at the middle levels, but a lot of decisions are made Whereas often I felt we would ask a question and it'd have to take a long time to get to the top to work its way back down. But, you know, the interesting thing, though, too, because it's not that everything in the United States is so much better. One of the things that I find fascinating is that when I was there uh, w working in Paris is that, you know, Americans always say, oh, no problem. We can do it. We can collaborate. We can make it work. 
And then in the end, it doesn't always work. And the French almost always take the opposite. I'm not sure this can work out. I really have to. But in the end, often make it work. You know, there's this sense that we often work in sort of opposite ways, but sometimes uh, hopefully achieving good results. You know, so I learned a lot. story like that? Like that specifically? I do. And I'm not even sure the people are around, but I... Um, when I was working in Paris, we worked on a project called Trans Voices, and it was a project that we did between New York and Paris. And we did radio spots. Um, we did television spots. We did um, uh, billboards in the metros. And we, and we did this simultaneously in New York and in Paris. And it was really interesting. In the U.S., the people were telling us, oh, okay, we can make it work. That won't be a problem. In the end, we had a lot of problems in the United States getting the visibility we wanted to. And I remember in the, being in a meeting with the head of the RATP, and she was saying, oh, there is no way we could make this happen. This would be very, very difficult. She was incredibly discouraging. The presence of the billboards in the Paris metros was extraordinary. It was far beyond anything in New York. And do you have like any other remarks or did you notice any other major differences in the attitudes of French people versus American people around art? In the United States, I often heard people say the question, what does this work mean? What does it mean? In France, the idea of what does a work of art mean is a kind of an absurd question. It's an experience. It's like, would you listen to a song and say, what does this song mean? Yes, it might have meanings, but you wouldn't say to yourself, what does it mean? You know, and Americans don't ask about maybe music, what does it mean? But they often will say, what does this painting mean? I don't understand it. They want to know what is the answer. And art is not about that. Art is not about providing answers or at least one or two answers. It's a multiplicity of answers, you know, and even more importantly, a much greater number of questions. I have to mention another major polemic that emerged during the Whitney Biennial of 2017 mm. around the work of the Brooklyn artist Anna Schutz, open casket, depicting the body of Emmett Till, the 14-year-old African-American mm. lynched in Mississippi mm -hmm. in 1955 over an accusation of flirting with a white woman. Mm -hmm. And when the biennial opened, an artist named Hannah Black posted a letter demanding that open casket be not only removed, but also destroyed. Mm -hmm. So do you think this debate reflects core dynamics of the American art world? And could the same thing have happened in France? Could it have happened in France? I'm not sure it would have happened in France. Um, I mean, I think that the, the positive side of this is I think it called attention to a lot of the contradictions and the conflicts and to the under. I mean, and, you know, and I think Dana Schutz is a great artist. I think that she painted that painting with absolutely the best of intents, with empathy. It was not about highlighting the beauty of the subject. In fact, her painting was hung not with a group of her own paintings, but was hung within a group of works by um, a diverse number of artists. But I think it did highlight uh, cultural sensitivities that... Um, you know, the Emmett Till image is a sacred image within the African-American community. And I have to say, I don't think I realized it to the full extent, even though I knew the story. And, you know, it's interesting. The family of Emmett Till even in the end came and was supportive of Dana Schutz. But I do understand uh, how painful that image is for people. You know, I, we fundamentally believe when we put a work up on the wall, we can't take it down unless it is either going to cause physical damage to somebody or something in some way. Because once you do it, you're always going to find people who want you to take a work of art down for one reason or another. And once you start doing that, I don't know where you end up. Now, um, you know, maybe had we thought from other perspectives earlier about it, might we have, you know, discouraged the artist from doing it? I don't know. Um, But I think what it was good for, it helped us to examine how we think about what we show. And I think it helped for the culture um, and, you know, for a discussion about why it was shown, how it was shown, under what circumstances it was shown and who. I mean, I really fundamentally hope that, you know, that people can comment on one another's cultures as long as they do it in a way that is respectful 
Because if we get to the point that only Jewish people can do Jewish artists and Puerto Rican can only, you know, address things about, we're really in trouble because it's the belief that there's no ability to go across cultures. I think that is really a frightening prospect. On the other hand, we also have to understand that there's certain specificities to each culture, and we can't be naive about that and pretend that anybody can just comment on anything all the time. So it's a matter of balance. It's a matter of sensitivity. Uh, it's a matter of discussion, and it's a challenge. I mean, we now, this is the new normal. I mean, I think we've been in the new Whitney building uh, three and a half years now, and I would say we probably had no fewer than six protests of one kind or another. Um, and it's not going away in any hurry, I don't think. And it, it's speaking to the instability of society. And it's interesting. It's as if the museum were the Agora, when we have the protests in the streets in France, you have them in museums. Why? I think people are so hopeful in many ways about contemporary cultural institutions. They want to hold us accountable. They want us to be even better than we can be. And that's great. I mean, I like that they want to do that, but they also have to understand that the cultural institutions are one small part of a much larger societal thing. And while we have great ideals and we push hard to do that, you know, we, we can help to lead the culture in, in certain small ways, but we can't fix all the problems of the culture. You know, this has to happen across the board. And, um, and also too, frankly, some people use cultural institutions like the Whitney for the visibility. They know that there's a show like Warhol. They know that people are watching and they take advantage of that and use it for PR and communication purposes. If people are really about protesting or discussing things because it's really about understanding, that's one thing. It's another thing, though, when cultural institutions are being used and abused as opposed to cultural institutions are um, part of the agora, part of the discussion. I'm fully in favor with discussions. I accept that protests are part of what we do. But I also think that people um, instrumentalize museums sometimes for their own either personal or political point of view. And that is not something that, you know, that I do appreciate. It's true, museums are faced with more and more political questions. And I think another one is a question that we find both in America and in France about reaching to audiences that don't normally have access to art. You know, like in France, we created the Louvre Lens, the Centre Pompidou Metz, but also we are trying to diversify the audience to bring new people within the museum. So how do you think museums should be doing that? Like, how can they make sure that people of all backgrounds have access to art? Fortunately, you know, in most parts of the United States, but not all, this I mean, the South in particular, is deprived to a degree. Um, you know, there is great access. There are great museums in cities all over the United States. And I mean, the trick is, is how do you get, to your point, how do you get the art that has been seen as part of a ruling white elite into other cultures? And the only way to do that is to start acknowledging their cultures and bringing their art into the museums, you know? I mean, we, we've been fortunate. We've collected a fair amount of, for example, African-American art over time. And we've had a, a you know, pretty good collection and exhibition program, not by far not perfect. But if I look at our Latino collection, our collection is not that strong. We haven't done yet. It is a huge population there. And there's great art that is being produced there. So we have to be responsive to the cultures within the culture. I mean, we now have a more diverse curatorial group than we've ever had, but it's relatively recent. And to me, it starts with the collection. It's the staff. It's the board. It's the program. It's every, It's about how you approach different cultures. It's the languages you use. It's, um, you know, it's everything about the institution. It's not simply having the curators. It's not simply having the board. It's not simply having the collection. It has to be all together. I mean... To have true diversity, it has to function on all levels of the institution. And there's hardly a museum in the United States that isn't working on that problem right now. Would you have a special secret recommendation for Americans who would visit France? You know, I mean, for me, still my favorite thing to do is basically to go to one of the public gardens 
and just sit down and read a newspaper all day and take a walk. I mean, there's the not... The Tuileries or the Luxembourg? Luxembourg is my favorite because I, li I, um, I used to live on Rue Wiesmont, just a, a short walk from, and I went almost every day with my daughter and I would spend the entire weekend there. And, you know, the idea of having um, even, even Central Park, you get some of that here in New York, even though it's an enormous park, but... Um, The sense of being able to slow down, the sense to have, um, you know, real kind of moments of peace. I think, you know, I think still in Paris, there is a sense that you can have a little bit of the pastoral life within the city. That notion of the pastoral life doesn't really exist in New York. New York is a constant drumbeat. And even in Central Park, you feel like people are riding their bikes and, you know, at great speeds, that they're walking, that they're hiking, that they're playing tennis. You, you feel it's all about accomplishment and it's all about uh, leisure as work. Thank you very much. You are very welcome. It was, it was a little all over the place, but no, that's okay. It's perfect. What is your French Proust and Madeleine? What smell? Oh, what I'll music? tell you. I, I got it for you. The smell of the rubber tires in the metro have a very, very specific smell that when I'm there, that's when I absolutely know that I'm in France. The Thing About France is available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, or wherever you get your podcasts. Special thanks to Sixième Son for our music, and to Force Majeure for our look and feel. For more information, visit thethingaboutfrance.com. Allez, c'est fini. Mm -hmm.